<clears throat> I'm to reintroduce myself. My name is Jonathan Drimmer. I'm a, a partner at Steptoe & Johnson in Washington, D.C. I also uh, have, for the last decade, been a semi-colleague of Dave's uh, at Georgetown teaching courses on war crimes, business, and human rights, and things along, along those lines. Uh, I'm going to focus on, and, and as Terry uh, suggested, the majority of my practice at, at Steptoe is dealing with compliance-related issues. Uh, that uh, companies face uh, in their overseas operations, how to uh, effectively comply with uh, U.S. laws in their foreign operations. I also do uh, litigation uh, as well, and I'll be talking uh, from, from that perspective and appreciate the invitation to do that. Um, by way of very brief introduction, uh, there, there has been uh, over the past maybe 15 or 20 years a sharp rise in uh, efforts to apply U.S. laws to overseas conduct. Um, and, and we see that both from a criminal uh, and a, a civil context. And, and rather than talk generally, I'm going to be focusing uh, primarily on uh, two of those laws that are uh, most commonly, or two of those areas that are most commonly um, uh, involved in these kinds of cases. The first is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, which is a criminal statute, and the second is, uh, is uh, on the tort side and dealing with overseas tort actions, transnational tort actions, including uh, some discussion uh, of, of the alien tort statute. <clears throat> to begin with the FCPA, just very quickly, what is it? It was enacted in, in 1978. It, it's, uh, it has uh, criminal components. It also has regulatory components. It's jointly administered by the Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, in its broadest formulation conceptually. It's an anti-bribery statute. Uh, it, it, it prohibits essentially um, uh, certain covered entities from providing anything of value to a foreign public official to receive some kind of a benefit to which the, uh, the entity or the individual wasn't otherwise uh, entitled. Uh, it applies to three classes of, uh, of individuals or entities, uh, any U.S. or foreign company that's listed on a U.S. exchange, uh, U.S. companies, U.S. citizens or nationals, and any person or company that uh, commits an act uh, in furtherance of, of an improper payment um, if it somehow touches the U U.S. commerce through telephone or mail or faxes. Uh, and, and this final provision, this final jurisdictional uh, bullet, is construed tremendously broadly by, uh, by DOJ as well as, as the SEC. Uh, in a recent case, for instance, in a settlement, the DOJ took the position that a payment made in U.S. dollars uh, creates U.S. jurisdiction because ultimately those dollars will have to be uh, transferred through and into uh, U.S. U.S. bank accounts. Uh, typically, you will have you know credit card payments, for instance, that may be routed from one country through a U.S. bank into another country. Jurisdiction, as I say, anyway, it's, it's interpreted to be very broadly, and the U.S. government is taking um, jurisdiction over uh, lots of cases that that don't seem uh, to have an immediate tie uh, to the uh, United States. As I mentioned, essentially anything of value to a foreign public official to gain a benefit. But two of the points that, that are worth noting about, about this application is, is, as in the alien tort context uh, and, and the transnational tort context, which we'll talk about in a second, often the, the issues, the incidents, don't arise based on conduct of companies themselves or U.S. citizens themselves, but uh, the, the most common ki kind of case is where a payment of some sort or something of value is provided by a local agent or third party, somebody who the company or individual might hire to perform certain on-the-ground functions uh, in, in the overseas context. So there is vicarious liability. It's a very broad uh, definitional and a very awkward definitional interpretation it's uh, substantial, it, it's a, a knowledge of a substantial probability of a pass-through being made. So you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt knowledge of a substantial probability, which, which as I say, is awkward. Uh, the second uh, bullet under here is that the payments also don't need to be made directly to a public official. We'll talk again in just a second about the public official piece. They can also be made to family members, other third parties associated with uh, public officials. Um, where it's deemed to be benefiting uh, the public uh, official itself. It's another common type of case. Uh, other things to note about it, the way that it has been interpreted by the Department of Justice, and, and I want to emphasize interpreted by the Department of Justice for one of the problem areas we'll come back to in a second, 
is that there isn't any minimum threshold. A small tip, uh, $10, uh, buying a dinner, these things are deemed to be of sufficient value to give rise to, to the statute and uh, a small payment that elicits a substantial benefit uh, can be highly problematic since benefits, since the, the penalties are calculated from um, the ultimate benefit that is received, not the amount of the payment, the amount of uh, the benefit. The defenses that you would, you would think might be applicable, this is how business is done in this country, or uh, the, the, the thing of value wasn't actually worth anything, or we didn't know about it, it was done by a local agent, these are just not going to work, that this is anti-competitive to U.S. business. It's just not going to work. The Department of Justice wants absolutely nothing to do with that, and um, they are going to uh, pursue cases uh, notwithstanding um, those, those kinds of claims. <clears throat> uh, at this point, the, the, and we're starting to roll into some of the issues, um, the enforcement of the law is incredibly aggressive by the Department of Justice and the SEC right now. I talk primarily about DOJ on the criminal side. I shouldn't leave out the SEC. Um, I, I in, in part talk about it. I spent six and a half years in the Department of Justice, so it rolls off my tongue. Um, right now, it's DOJ's second highest law enforcement priority. It's been publicly declared behind uh, terrorism. Right now, they have 130 open investigations, which is five times the number of four years ago. This is quite clearly a very aggressive enforcement priority for justice, and they are receiving resources, um, uh, funding, positions, agents, uh, in, order to, in order to pursue this. The penalties can be tremendously harsh. Uh, in 2009 alone, there was more than a billion dollars of payments made by companies back to the government, whether it's through penalties or, or disgorgements, uh, uh, et cetera. Some of the numbers are fairly high. Siemens, I'm sure many have heard about, was 800 million in aggregate. Uh, Halliburton KBR was 579 million uh, in connection with payments in Nigeria. And uh, one of the executives uh, from KBR involved in that uh, agreed to a jail sentence of not less than seven years. So there is very aggressive enforcement and uh, very harsh penalties associated with the law. Uh, what are the most common areas, uh, what are the most common locations? Uh, most frequent areas would be oil, uh, companies in the oil, gas, energy, mining sector, not dissimilar from the alien tort and another transnational tort context. Uh, medical companies in the sense of pharma companies and medical device companies, they are commonly targeted. Uh, communications firms, um, particularly in the, in the, the cell phone uh, related arenas, uh, are often hit. You see cases coming from all over, but most commonly uh, they're from places where there's a substantial foreign investment uh, as well as relatively weak governments in terms of reputations for controls and corruption. Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, Middle East, South and Central America is where the nucleus of F FCPA cases arise and they come up in a number of different fact patterns which I list, but ultimately the point is Anytime there is a touch of the federal, uh, of, a, of a local government, um, of a domestic government, uh, by a corporate entity or its agent, you do have the prospect for uh, FCPA-related uh, problems. Now, what are some of the problems with this? And, and this, I, I, there, there are a number of problems with the law, and, and in some ways, um, there, there are elements that are also similar to the ATS in terms of interpretations and, and sometimes um, lack thereof. Uh, there are no implementing regulations for uh, the FCPA. Um, essentially, it, it is a law that's administered primarily, as I say, by the Department of Justice. And, and the difficulty is that the issues under the law, and there are a number of issues, are almost never litigated. Why? Because the cases almost always focus against corporations. And as we know, corporations pretty much can't afford an indictment. An indictment is a death sentence to most, to most companies, I'm generalizing, but that is something that a corporation is going to avoid. It's going to settle and live to see another day rather than try to operate a business while it is under indictment for foreign corruption. So the companies invariably settle. The, uh, the issues under the law don't get litigated. And so what ultimately we're left with is an almost unfettered discretion by the Department of Justice in how the nuances and how the application of this law is interpreted. Um, DOJ will say, you look at the settlement agreements for guidance, but, but of course, you know, we all know that doesn't go through formal rulemaking, that doesn't go through 
um, uh, the Administrative Procedure Act. It's basically the Department of Justice saying, uh, this is how we see the law uh, being applied, and therefore um, you should follow our interpretation uh, as opposed to a judicial interpretation that, that actually um, puts some, um, um, some check uh, to the balance. Uh, examples of a couple of problems that illustrate my point. Who is a public official? Right? The law prohibits providing anything of uh, value uh, to a public official to receive an improper benefit. Some of these questions are obvious if you're a full-time employee of a, of a state entity. But often the cases arise with uh, privatized entities, entities in which foreign governments own uh, a portion. They may own 25 percent or 50 percent or they may be able to appoint board members and therefore have some degree of control. Uh, DOJ and the SEC have staked out a very aggressive position saying that even a, even a passive ownership, uh, even minority control, some control over a uh, foreign uh, entity <clears throat> by a foreign government will render its employees um, public officials for purposes of the FCPA. So you might think you're doing business with a private entity but based on um, control and ownership issues, in fact, you're doing business with a state-owned entity. Is that a valid position? I don't know. Um, uh, certainly, it would be nice to, to have that litigated and to be able to see what the judiciary thinks on this point. It, it's a, as I say, it's a fairly aggressive position um, uh, intuitively, but ultimately issues like that uh, aren't being litigated. Jurisdiction, I mentioned that jurisdiction is, is, is at least implicitly being asserted well, it's explicitly being asserted as at least a basis, it may not be the sole basis, uh, for payments in U.S. dollars. Again, it would be nice to have uh, an independent judiciary declare one way or the other whether uh, foreign companies that make payments in U.S. dollars are or are not uh, subject to the dictates of the FCPA. Uh, one of the thorny areas deals with acquisitions. A, foreign, a wholly foreign company that uh, engages in some kind of a transaction, the FCPA doesn't apply, uh, the company is later acquired, later acquired by a U.S. company. The uh, government, the U.S. government, is taking the position that that subsequent acquisition nonetheless will create FCPA exposure. So it wasn't a crime at the time it was committed. Um, it was um, uh, done before there was any jurisdiction with the U.S., but the subsequent insertion of U.S. jurisdiction, the government contends, nonetheless creates FCPA exposure. Again. Uh, not so sure that that's, that that's a, a valid position. Would uh, love to see that one litigated. Hopefully, uh, the department has said it is bringing more cases against individuals. Hopefully, more cases will end up being litigated that help define the parameters of what this law means. We're also seeing more civil cases, derivative actions, shareholder suits, um, common law fraud cases, um, regular class actions based on, on civil RICO, et cetera, that are being filed premised on uh, overseas corruption issues and FCPA issues. Perhaps in that context, some of these issues will also help to be defined. But right now, um, and particularly from a compliance side, you're operating in an area where the Department of Justice is just basically running the show on what the parameters of this law are. My second example, um, the second issue I wanted to, to touch on dealt, deals with uh, personal injuries. And that does include the Alien Tort Statute, which of course <coughs> Terry uh, talked about um, at, at, at length, but it also talks about a much larger class of cases that uh, deal with injuries uh, that, that occur abroad involving uh, foreign uh, plaintiffs. Nonetheless, the case is being brought for various reasons uh, in U.S. courts, and that's the class that I, I want to talk about. Uh, why, in, why are these cases brought? In the, and there are thousands of those, whereas with the Alien Tort Statute, we'll talk about the number involving corporations anyway is, is in the hundreds against, um, in, the, in the larger context, uh, it's, it's in the many thousands. Um, <clears throat> why are these cases being brought in the U.S.? Well, certainly um, one of the reasons is, of course, the prospect of recovery. Um, punitive damages uh, does provide with a, uh, a, a, a substantial motive to bring cases in the United States, the belief that the damage awards are going to be higher here than anywhere else. <clears throat> it is relatively easy um, from a jurisdictional standpoint to establish minimum contacts. You have uh, a number of very favorable uh, mechanisms that are associated with the U.S. litigation system that don't exist abroad, whether, or at least in every country abroad, whether it's class action, contingency fee, some of the pretrial discovery mechanisms, and of course, 
uh, you don't have loser pay. All of these are helpful uh, for cases being brought. You also have a, a talented and sophisticated plaintiff's bar who knows what they're doing um, uh, and certainly sees the prospects of recovery. And I, I should add, Terry's absolutely right, that there is uh, often a perception of hostility in foreign courts to, uh, to <coughs> some of these claims that are brought against companies that may be major employers or major supporters uh, of, of foreign governments. Um, Terry went through what essentially the ATS is in context. Let me just add uh, some, some uh, numbers and, and metrics to this. Um, in the last 15 years, and Terry talked about the revival of the statute and it's really coming alive against corporations in the mid-1990s, uh, there have been a grand total uh, by our study, in-house in study, uh, of just over 140 cases where the statute is invoked as a jurisdictional basis against one or more corporate defendants. And uh, this is largely premised on counting up judicial decisions and uh, identifying filed cases where we can, where there is no um, uh, final decision yet. Uh, of the 140, uh, the numbers bear out that, that essentially this resuscitation uh, has, is very much alive. There have been about 115 of those 143-ish uh, in the past 15 years. That's 82%. We're seeing about six to 10 <clears throat> new cases uh, under the alien tort statute each year against uh, corporate defendants. Um, these tend to be in the areas of, uh, of extractive industries, oil, gas, mining, and energy. You also see a lot of cases involving financial institutions, food and beverage, transportation, manufacturing, again, communications-related uh, uh, entities. Uh, often fact patterns will come up involving for foreign security. Foreign security is the single most common set of, of circumstances in which a case arises. You'll have a company that needs to rely on foreign uh, a foreign security service to provide security, and indeed they'll go and do something that perhaps they shouldn't do, and uh, boom, a suit arises. Uh, labor cases, environmental cases, which have fared not terribly well under the ATS, and also some of the historical <clears throat> and regime type cases, um, uh, Terry mentioned talisman case against, uh, the case against talisman uh, doing business in uh, Sudan allegedly supporting the, uh, the Sudanese government in its genocidal efforts. Uh, some of the historical cases, the World War II era cases, the Holocaust era cases, uh, slave labor cases will come under uh, the ATS as well. In the non-ATS context, um, it very frequently find both uh, class actions, mass cases, uh, the mass tort cases, Vioxx cases, uh, other types of uh, cases um, uh, with with uh, um, uh, pharma, you'll find uh, a lot of individual cases, slip and fall cases, airplane crashes, car crashes abroad, uh, a whole variety of different types of personal injury cases, the same kinds of personal injury cases that you do find based on <clears throat> domestic uh, conduct. One thing I do want to touch on is, and, and emphasize a little bit more, um, is something that Terry talked about, and I want to talk about some of the other areas of it. And that is the outcomes here. Um, starting with the ATS, but globally, most of these cases are dismissed. Most of the ATS cases to date, and I want to emphasize to date, and, and most of the uh, other types of overseas tort cases are dismissed. Um, and I want to emphasize on the ATS that the, the numbers are changing. You see more cases staying in courts for longer, perhaps because there are more defined uh, uh, rules and decisions from the judiciary, uh, perhaps because plaintiff's lawyers are, are getting a greater understanding of some of the basic principles of the ATS. But today, you still have numbers where um, certainly well in excess of 50% of the cases are dismissed either on 12B6 or summary judgment motions and don't make it through to, to trial. There have been four corporate trials under the ATS, uh, two defense verdicts, um, uh, one uh, plaintiff's verdict that came out um, this past summer under a ratification theory of secondary liability. This was in New York. Uh, one where the plaintiff did prevail, but not on the ATS claim, on a, on a negligence, a state-oriented a state, uh, claim that was also included uh, in the lawsuit. You have a handful of dismissals. But the rest, 
uh, are either pending or have been dismissed, and of that, the substantial majority uh, are, are dismissed. Um, forum nonconvenience is most certainly the, that is the most common basis um, in the non-ATS context. It's a fairly common basis in the ATS context. Um, in ATS, you also have a number of other hurdles that Terry, that Terry mentioned um, outside of the ATS context. Um, if basically, you, you don't have any cover, as Terry indicated, of a U.S. law suggesting that jurisdiction here might be appropriate. And, and there are judicial doctrines that say uh, that a foreign plaintiff that has injuries outside of the jurisdiction and yet chooses to bring the case in a different jurisdiction does receive less deference. There's a Supreme Court case that, that, that identifies that. And then when you go to the public and private interest factors that courts look at for forum non-purposes, again, they tend not to weigh terribly well towards plaintiffs, and that is what ultimately results in the um, very substantial forum non-convenience uh, rates. Uh, some have argued, some scholars who study this, I have not done this study, uh, have argued that this overwhelming rate of dismissals uh, on forum non-bases does suggest that U.S. courts are being overused to vindicate this broader class of, uh, of foreign torts. Uh, we are increasingly seeing in the forum non-context dismissals that are conditioned on certain, on the defendants accepting certain propositions. Uh, they might be uh, conditioned on acceptance of jurisdiction in the court to which it's transferred. They might be uh, acceptance of a condition of, of satisfying any judgment which might be rendered uh, in that court. Um, and so that is one of the, one of the um, distinctions that we've seen over the past few years is more conditional um, forum non-dismissals. Uh, but even with those conditions, uh, relatively few, not never, certainly in, in the Chevron Ecuador case is an excellent example, but uh, relatively few are, are then uh, refiled abroad, which again, those who've, who've studied this will suggest supports the argument that um, there is a, a uh, overuse of, of these uh, of the types of actions. A couple of points I do want to make, though, on uh, the ATS. Um, one of the areas that, that we do have and, and that uh, Terry alluded to, but I think it's important to note, is that we are really dealing with a lot of very um, confused and difficult principles. Courts have split in different ways on what are the standards of liability, what laws do and don't apply, um, a, a state action, do you look to uh, U.S. law, do you look to international law? These very fundamental questions in state action is, of course, an element of, of most of the offenses. And uh, the Supreme Court in Sosa certainly tried to clarify to some extent what applies under the ATS, but when you hear the standard recited, specific, obligatory, um, uh, it, 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 what does that mean in the context of, uh, of, of legal interpretation? And I think courts have struggled with trying to take some of the international principles where things may not necessarily be codified and try to uh, issue um, uh, rules associated with these vague international principles. And it's been a, it's been a struggle, and courts have, have noted and, and articulated those, that, that struggle. Uh, one other piece that I do want to <clears throat> mention that is of, uh, of some concern um, are you do see uh, cases uh, in, the, in the tort context, a higher or at least a fair number where you do see uh, what I say here is overseas um, shenanigans, documented instances of fraud. Uh, and, and whether that is because there's a particular susceptibility given some of the basic facts. Um, you, don't, you may have local lawyers who don't abide by uh, ethical rules uh, of the bar. You have highly indigent uh, uh, plaintiffs who, who may have motives um, to, to shade the truth. Uh, you may have um, uh, foreign judiciaries that end up getting involved, foreign laboratories, but you do end up finding um, a, a troubling uh, number of cases that do have some kind of corporate, some kind of uh, over, some kind of shenanigans, let's say, that, that are involved. Uh, one example in, in particular, the DBC uh, cases in Nicaragua, cases uh, brought by uh, thousands of um, uh, workers of banana plantations <clears throat> in Nicaragua claiming they were rendered sterile by exposure to DBCP. There's a decision that came out this year by Judge, uh, by Lynn Cheney in, in Los Angeles that just excoriates the plaintiffs claiming it was a massive conspiracy, that the claims were basically cooked up, that the plaintiffs were fed false documents, that they were told 
uh, ultimately what to say. Many weren't sterile. Many had never even worked on the banana plantations. Um, it's one example of, of these troubling types of shenanigans uh, that you do uh, see in this context. Uh, to wrap up, uh, again, um, you, we're going to see, I expect, given the, the rise of the global economy and, uh, and government enforcement priorities, uh, a continued number of both criminal and civil cases premised on overseas conduct brought here in the United States and certainly uh, with the FCPA and the transnational tort cases as they suggest, we're going to continue to struggle with some of these basic issues of interpretation, fairness, uh, et cetera, as we, as we work through those. Thank you.